This morning we're going to talk about metal soaps and molecular self-assembly, uh, starting out with Francesca Casadillo, who I'm delighted to introduce. Francesca joined the Art Institute in July of 2003 as the museum's first Andrew W. Mellon Senior Conservation Scientist and founding member of the Scientific Research Laboratory. In January of 2018, she was named the Granger Executive Director of Conservation and Science. Francesca received her PhD and MS degrees in chemistry from the University of Milan. She's also the founder and co-director of the Northwestern University Art Institute of Chicago Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts, or New Access. Casadillo has authored over 80 publications in the scientific and conservation literature, including essays in museum catalogs. In 2006, she was the recipient of the L'Oreal Art and Science Color Silver Prize. So... Francesca, we're all still wondering when you sleep. It's extremely <laughs> impressive. <laughs> and uh, Francesca's topic this morning is going to be metal soaps in art, the defining issue of paintings conservation in the 21st century that art history doesn't know about. Please join me. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for the kind introduction. And I really want to thank um, Jennifer and uh, Jennifer Mass and Peter Miller for uh, allowing us to uh, think more broadly about issues of in conservation and science that uh, um, we address every day. I also cannot fail to notice that today, I don't know if it's the theme of that or the, the uh, prospect of spending a whole morning on metal soaps, that the, this room is a little bit less full than it was <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> I also had expected uh, an audience um, where art historians and graduate students in history and art history would be, and I see I'm surrounded by many co uh, colleagues in conservation and conservation science. So some of my remarks may be perhaps more uh, worth uh, for posterity and for those other colleagues that will be watching the recorded video. Um, so uh, I, I've chosen to start with this image uh, that is a cross-section of uh, Van Gogh's bedroom in our collection because it's quite a wonderful example of active matter. Not only there are uh, metal soaps forming, which are the subject of today's session, but also the uh, pink Cochineal Lake is uh, faded. So definitely a picture that uh, has been active in terms of its color change and uh, is still active in terms of the soaps. And uh, again, I don't really need to make this point to this audience, but really um, the important aspect here is to challenge the per perception that paintings are two-dimensional objects. We're really thinking about three-dimensionality and also about how dynamic the systems are. They're not immutable. And we know very well, everybody who's here, that there's millions of chemical reactions that happen every day below the surface of these paintings. As well, um, as we were discussing yesterday with uh, all this uh, uh, esteemed colleagues about active matter, uh, as we know, all matter is active. It's a matter of time scales. And so oil paint will have a time scale of um, uh, evaporation of the solvents within minutes and hours from the application of the first auto-oxidation reactions in, again, hours and months, and then curing in months and years. There are then, of course, collecting timelines. I think it was Chris McGlinchey that yesterday mentioned this uh, statistic that I found reported in Paul Taylor's book, an art historian who's at the Warburg Institute and talks about condition and the aging of painting, one of the rare uh, uh, books on this topic. And he cites another scholar, Van der Waude, in his book, Volume and Value, that reports that um, the survivor rate of 17th and 18th century Dutch paintings concluded that by the end of the 20th century, over 99% of those paintings have been destroyed. And so really to think that, um, of course, it's not only degradation of the paintings, but what has also been evoked fire, neglect, other uh, aspects that, that bring to these losses. Uh, but I, I sort of want to bring back, especially at this time when as museum professionals we're interrogating ourselves about the collecting practices of our institutions and how objects 
came to our institutions. I want to reassert with my presentation today the importance of museums for collecting these objects and the importance of the work that conservators and scientists do in this institution for preserving the material evidence uh, and our material culture, because those objects in public collections are those that then art historians can examine and write art history and reassess uh, the art history sort of storylines that we have, um, that we have um, been presenting and publishing. And then, of course, there are museum timelines. And we all know that uh, paintings get treated and retreated uh, multiple times. And this is an effect on their evolution. Uh, I have many colleagues who have spent much more time than me really devoting uh, their careers to the studies of metal soaps. So I will not present you with a structure of what metal soaps are, yeah, I have a feeling that you'll see some, their interaction of heavy metals in the paint with the medium of the paint, the oil, and they really affect paintings from uh, antiquity up to the present day. And I will focus, Jennifer gave me this charge, mostly on modern, uh, modern paintings. Of course, here we're focusing on the death of paintings, so we only are talking about paintings, but these metal soaps are found in, on metal surfaces. They're found on stone surfaces. There we find them in works on paper, recent, most recently in our work on Gauguin's prints and drawings. And here I have a sort of a panorama of the uh, way that metal soaps affect uh, paintings. And, uh, uh, as you, uh, many of you know, uh, the sort of most spectacular uh, representation is in terms of protrusions. And this is, in my view, a picture by Yap Bone on a Picabia painting, the most amazing image of a protrusion. Uh, peeling of surfaces, delamination, and also um, they have been identified as being responsible in the reliquifying of some uh, types of paintings, especially um, uh, some production uh, of the uh, 50s and 60s. I want to make a note, a note to our colleague, uh, Maureen Cott, uh, who works at the SRF, and I will talk briefly about this, that not Perhaps framing the issue of metal soaps by thinking of change and not just thinking in terms of degradation is more appropriate because there are cases where, in fact, this metallic uh, carboxylate stabilizes the paint, and um, so we should not uh, we should not forget about that. Because I think again that many of uh, the colleagues that will follow me will focus on also the history, reviewing the history of metal soaps. Uh, I'm very excited to share with you that we have now, and it just came out about a week ago, uh, a book that uh, many of uh, the panelists here, um, Patria Noble and Silvia Centeno also helped me co-edit, that really looks at the state of the art of scientific and conservation research in, uh, in the um, field of metal soaps. And if you thought that two hours of this was too much, uh, you're going to have 415 pages uh, to read uh, in, in the near future. So I want to spend a few moments on scientific uh, research. And to me, the field of metal soap research is really exemplary in what we should do and, and, and also exemplary of the maturity of our field because it is combining both theoretical studies and the modeling of the soaps together with studies of model systems, so mixing different types of oils with different types of pigments and looking at the reactivity, as well as um, looking at case studies and networking those case studies and sharing them and starting to do some epidemiological uh, studies. And I will talk a little bit about the research that we're doing with the Center for Scientific Studies on the Ar in the Arts on O'Keeffe. And the, this picture that is a memento mori uh, wasn't chosen by chance. And a lot of the citations that I will have throughout my work or take throughout my presentation are taken from uh, the book, just to emphasize that it's an essential read. Uh, this project also, I mean, this, this issue of metal soaps also illustrate what we uh, term as a multi-scale project, how nanoscale reactivity affects macro-scale properties that we see on paintings. And again, uh, this is an example from Van Gogh's bedroom, and you can see a cross-section 
uh, illustrates the uh, metal soaps. And this is an image from our colleague uh, Jan Ermans uh, at uh, the University of Amsterdam of a TEM cross section. This is the only thing that doesn't come from Van Gogh's bedroom. It's a, a model sample. Together with Stephanie Zaleski, a postdoc in our group, we want to explore the uh, nanostructures of this uh, very, very small domains, and we're developing tip enhanced Raman spectroscopy tools to examine this. And also, another really amazing adv uh, advance in scientific research that is possible today, not only because there are much bigger critical mass of uh, scientists looking at this problem, but also because of the very rich academic collaboration, is that we can look at these systems in a dynamic fashion. Not only have a picture of what's degraded, but also look at migrations of uh, materials within this three-dimensional structure of a paint layer. And this, again, is a graph from Jan Ermans from, that you will find in the book. Uh, I cannot stress enough how this research can only happen in a collaborative space. Uh, and at uh, the Art Institute of Chicago and Northwestern, we've also benefited from uh, important funding. And it's really the sustained funding and the work of many graduate students and postdocs that can sustain this advancement. Because as Jennifer mentioned, we as museum conservation scientists have a lot of exhibition related and catalog related work that we also need to um, do. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, illustrating some case studies in modern and contemporary art because I feel that also uh, in, in modern and contemporary art, the situation of metal soaps is a little bit more complex. So I'm presenting here uh, an image of Roy Lichtenstein brushstroke with spatter. And what I also want to uh, bring your attention to is some of the tools that are enabling this more widespread mapping of the phenomenon that certainly work with unvarnished pictures uh, and modern picture. And what you see here, for many of you may be familiar, is a portable FTIR uh, instrument. And in this case, um, we are finding not only zinc stearate, which is probably an additive of the paint, the white that you see uh, as the base layer here is a titanium white. And, but also we find on these modern surfaces another type of carboxylate that will not be the focus of this presentation, but I've been interrogating myself a lot about because we find it quite pervasively in 20th century paintings, and those are zinc oxalates. And the role of oxalates in how they affect painted surfaces is still something much to explore. We know that with um, stone uh, monuments, these are very insoluble and can change the surface. Uh, color of stones, I feel that we quite don't know what zinc oxalates are doing to modern surfaces at the moment. Uh, those of you who know me also know that at the Art Institute we spent a uh, decade and more, and my colleague Maria Kokore is carrying this work forward looking at uh, enamel paints. And another thing that I was want to point out in terms of the spectrum of metal soaps and metal carboxylates is that um, Manufacturers of enamel paint in the early 20th century caught up on the fact that zinc reacts very fast with oils. And in fact, they, there are recipes that Maria has researched that, oh, and I see that things have sort of scrambled up a little bit, uh, that recommend to let the paste, the zinc oxide paste, mature with the oil. And this is certainly to let this reactivity of the oil with the zinc oxide to make soap develop so that in fact what you get is a very highly dispersed paint. So without the addition of uh, other stearates, you can get a very highly distributed paint. And we have focus our attention on rippling paints. Here you see that we uh, have been evoked yesterday. They were used by Picasso and other avant-garde artists. You see here a picture of Edward Quinn, uh, by Edward Quinn of Picasso with a rippling can at the back. And uh, this paint that has a lot of zinc soaps, for some of you who are scientists in the audiences, you recognize the particular shape in the FTIR of zinc carboxylate that are networked to the polymerized structure of the oil. Uh, probably the good zinc carboxylates, uh, here in a painting by uh, Francis Picabia. Um, these paintings and these surfaces, these rippling surfaces that are full of zinc soaps, are extremely stable. 
Maria has surveyed collections in the US and Europe because we were quite interested in looking also at matters of conditions. And this painting, some of whom are almost 100 years old, are still fairly stable despite being full of soaps. Um, this is another example, a collaboration with the um, Costanza Migliani and the Mola group in Italy of a Picasso painting at the Musee Picasso in Antibes. And in this case, too, in addition to zinc stearates, um, the paint, and here you see an UV image that shows how even a monochromatic white painting, when you start looking at it with various uh, techniques, can show a much more complex picture. Um, but this surfaces to show not only zinc stearates, but also zinc oxalates. Another example of active matter, uh, um, very seminal painting by Kazmin Marevich that has in recently joined our collection uh, because we were talking about activities in many levels. And of course, being a chemist, my talk is more focused on the chemistry of these paintings. But interestingly, about this painting that was included in the 0 to 10, uh, the last futurist exhibition of paintings that search of started suprematism and abstraction. Um, this painting has been exhibited in two orientations. And just a month ago, we flipped our painting upside down. So the, um, the uh, purple element is now facing downwards. So how about that for active matter? <laughs> um, this painting has a lead white ground with a zinc white paint on top. And again, by doing a non-invasive analysis of the surface, zinc oxalates, zinc stearates, and other soaps have been uh, identified. Uh, also, and here I couldn't resist from showing also this detail of the purple we were talking yesterday again about when materials have significance. Um, this purple color that also shows some zinc stearates in it uh, has, is a cobalt violet. And cobalt violet was the um, topic of a, the subject of a poem by Mayakovsky. And also uh, Malevich was accused of bourgeoisie um, in Russia because of his use of cobalt violet. So talk about charged materials. Um, there are cases when um, zinc um, carboxylates, soaps and oxalates are uh, not necessarily completely benign, and some of these examples emerged in the um, context of our collaboration through the Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts with the Guggenheim Museum and our study of the works by Moholy Naj. And this in particular emerged in those paintings. They are painted on very unusual substrates, uh, namely um, PMMA, acrylic sheets, where the colors are really meant to float uh, on the surface, and uh, through a suite of non-invasive uh, equipment, we were able to map all the distribution of materials, and there are many, many in instances of zinc stearates and zinc oxalates, and again, the, the value of these non-invasive techniques is so important because we can map extensively over the surface of the paintings, and we can start to get really a sense of the distribution of our paintings. There are cases when both the uh, zinc soaps, but also the presence of free fatty acids. And in this case, it's possible that the oxalates are related more to the production of, zinc, of cadmium yellow than just um, zinc in the paint, uh, make it so that there is delamination from uh, the uh, surface. And I know from my conversations with Patria, who will close this session, this was an interesting case for us of a risk management decision-making process in terms of what to do with this painting. So we had interesting conversation with um, Julie Barton, the conservator at the Guggenheim, uh, who was concerned about wanting to re-adhere the painting and not being able to use an organic solvent because of the PMMA medium, but being concerned that by intru introducing humidity and an aqueous-based consolidant, this would accelerate the formation of soaps, which we all know that humidity has a, such a, an important role in their formation. And this was really a very interesting discussion because yes, we need to accept the risk of introducing humidity because the painting is actually detaching from the surface of the war. So we need the re-adherence of, of the flake in the consolidation was more important than what 
may happen in 50 or 100 years. So we had to address the here and now. Um, and again, when we look at these objects, our search of two-dimensional objects and from a distance and from an image, uh, they look like beautiful planes of colors and lines that are floating in space. When we start to look at them closely, this, um, the chemistry, the active matter, starts to affect uh, the surface properties. And there are some cases where this, um, the impact of soaps and, and other additives is still invisible. In this case, uh, Moholy Naj had a preference for a particular uh, manufacturer of vermilion paint that contains magnesite. This has been shown by work uh, by colleagues in the UK and in the Netherlands that is linked to um, sensitivity of oil surfaces to aqueous cleanings. Uh, there are other cases though where there are uh, very interesting crusts and other formations that in this layer that is rich in, rich in lead and zinc um, are forming and are affecting the surface. But when soaps don't form, that can be a problem too. So in this um, black area with ivory black, there's nothing for the fatty acids to uh, link to, to uh, get a complex with, and you get a surface exudation of fatty acid that makes the surface tacky and changes the chromatic value. So for the last five minutes that I have allotted to me, I want to focus on a recent project on Georgia O'Keeffe that has really uh, been led by Mark Walton here in the uh, audience and Oli Cossert to show again a, a shift from looking at the chemistry to taking a search of an epidemiological approach at how we look at uh, metal soaps. And so this is a very interesting case because uh, we've been partnering with Dale Conkright at the O'Keeffe Museum, and the O'Keeffe Museum has uh, an incredible repository of the artist's materials, her correspondence, and they have been pretty much from the creation of the works to today, been able to monitor their uh, environmental exposure, their loan history, etc. And what is also interesting is that in her correspondence with Carolyn Keck, who will be familiar to many of us, one of the four mothers of conservation, um, Georgia O'Keeffe herself in 1947 lamented observing the appearance of protrusions uh, in paintings that she created between 1928 and 36. And on the other hand, art historians had in some occasions attributed this uh, protrusions to grains of sand that because of her proclivity to sometimes paint outdoor could have been sand from the desert. And I'm sure that Petria will mention other occurrences of interpretation of metal soaps protrusions are as sand embedded in a sort of pre brac sand, 17th century. Um, sand embedded in, uh, in the paints. Um, I will focus on the epidemi epidemiological uh, as aspect, but I also want to acknowledge uh, our postdoc, Annette Ortiz Miranda, who has been doing both a morphological study of all the different manifestations of this type of soaps and all the different shapes as well as determining and confirming with various means of analysis that they are indeed uh, lead carboxylates uh, and that pretty much in the um, area of the soap, all the lead, for those of you who are familiar with FDIR's uh, spectra, all the lead white is gone and it's all in the form of lead carboxylates. But really the, uh, the point of the project that has been funded by the NEH and really has benefited from Mark's collaboration with our colleagues in computer sciences, can we monitor, because this protrusions evolved even during the artist's lifetime, can we monitor and quantify them and see whether lending or being in other environments could cause uh, a change in what we observe on the, on the surface? And they have developed various methods that basically divorce an image of the surface from its color and maps the morphology of the surface very accurate to the point of being able to do 3D rendering of the shape of the individual grains. In addition, they've also uh, pitted artificial intelligence against human vision, as, as other colleagues have done, and search of segregated various areas depending on their composition and color, extracted the surface uh, um, 
shape and using machine learning to actually quantify uh, the uh, number of protrusions that are observable. Uh, this method is still under development and, and will be improved, but I certainly uh, can speculate that like the automated threat counting will really lead to great improvement in the way that we uh, assess conditional paintings. Another aspect that uh, recently has been uh, developed by Oli and Mark and Dale is really to use um, commodity devices to do this kind of scanning because also the purpose of the NEH grant has been to develop tools that we can give to conservators or any museums that in this case use an iPad to uh, monitor the surface shape through uh, deflectometry and is able to identify these materials through an app that if you have a question mark would be able for sure to address uh, and that way we can really create a data bank of the evolution of this phenomena in time and they're easy and fast to develop and it is our hope that this uh, uh, software will be an open source software where everybody can upload their images. Uh, I feel that this work has been so powerful and important that uh, 20 years after Petria's first observation of uh, metal soaps in Rembrandt, the press is also starting to take notice. And I've reported a few articles, one of which authored by our own Jennifer Mass. Also, I cannot fail to admire the uh, artificial intelligence deployed by our friends at Google, because as I was trying to retrieve for this presentation examples of this uh, uh, press coverage that features Sylvia's work and the Dutch work and our work, um, pesky pop-ups about the Meta Sops book would keep <laughs> like coming up, uh, encouraging somebody who clearly has an interest for the field to purchase the book. Um, but what about art history? When we were organizing the Met of Soaps conference with colleagues at the Rijksmuseum in 2016, we were struggling with identifying an art historian who could give the keynote keynote address at the conference. And uh, so this prompted me to look at when art history really took notice of this important and heated debate in the conservation community. And I was, of course, brought back to um, the, con the cleaning controversies at the National Gallery in the 40s and in the 60s, and also at um, at, with the cleaning of paintings in the 50s at the Yale art galleries. And it struck me that really the point is search of this point, this, this point of contact and the debate is really stopping at the surface with the cleaning and the search of color changes in those pictures. And it's really just stopping at the image itself. But this is really just the tip of the iceberg. How can we let our colleagues appreciate the complexity below, that happened below the surface and what impact that can be for our interpretation of these paintings? And I think that very importantly, and this is an initiative that has been um, supported by the Mellon Foundation in Chicago and other places, the idea of engaging in a dialogue with art historians in training, graduate students who are coming to the museum and looking at the objects, uh, and looking at the objects sometimes with artists here, you see Kerry James Marshall in our storage uh, discussing his paintings, is very important. And really that we should continue to foster, like it's done here at Bard, this dialogue and closing the loop between the scientific research, the conservation, and the art history. Because to me, more importantly than the loop, the most important questions happen in the center, when these disciplines really engage in dialogue um, together. And this, I have to confess, sort of this thought emerged in a discussion that I had with um, Jennifer. When we disregard active matter and we only focus on the surface and we disregard the fact that materials, as opposed to what Cesare Brandi, who was the director of the Instituto Centrale del Restauro for some time and wrote a seminal book on the theory of conservation. He cites in one of those articles in Burlington magazines related to the cleaning controversy, 
He says, the materials in a work of art must be induced to serve in subordinate capacity the image itself. But what happens when the materials are insubordinate? And so we're used to thinking of girl with a pearl earring like this, but, uh, and this was public, published by Jorge Badium some years ago, we all know that really below the surface, the, the condition is very different. And if we disregard this, we're really limiting ourselves to the realm of Instagram artistry, which is a gen mass uh, term. And when some art historians, and I've met some, say, I'm just interested in iconography, why should I look at the objects? Uh, we need to remind them that sometimes these objects and what they're seeing in an image may be the result of a conservator. And they may lead to images that are very convincing, but they're very wrong. And so with this, uh, I thank you for your attention and really hope that we will never have to tell our visitors for a better look at our painting, go to our website. Thank you very much. <laughs>